Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Undisbursed Community Development Block Grant Funds at Risk of Cancellation 2014 Grants. For the next hour, we'll walk you through how to know if you have a balance of 2014 CDBG grant funds, how to find those funds, and how to commit and draw those funds. Please note that this is not the live session. The recording of the live session was not acceptable quality, so we are re-recording this session to post on HUD Exchange. We will include answers to some of the questions we received. My name is Rob Srantz, and I'm with the Cloudburst Group. I am joined today by a panel of my colleagues at Cloudburst, John Coons. Hi, John. Hey, Rob. And Susan Walsh. Hi, Susan. Hi. And although HUD is not joining us today for this re-recording, we would like to acknowledge the contributions of HUD headquarters staff, Puping Wang and Aaron Martin. Uh, also on the Cloudburst team, uh, Nikki Deininger, who served as the registrar and host, Joel Warren, who managed the question queue, and Laura Dietert, who authored the slides we'll be presenting today. Thank you all. And this webinar is made possible by technical assistance funding provided through HUD's Office of Community Planning and Development. And at this time, I'll turn it over to John. Thanks, Rob. So at the end of today's session, uh, we do hope that you'll have a better understanding of how to uh, find, release, and reallocate undisbursed 2014 grant funds, and ultimately to complete your 2014, to, to ultimately complete 2014 fund draws by the end of the September 11th, 2021 deadline. Let's just talk about the agenda moment. First, we'll do a brief overview of why you may have 2014 grant balances remaining and make sure that we have a foundation to talk about how to expend them. In the session, we will cover how to determine your 2014 grant balance status, how to find unexpended 2014 CDBG funds. We'll look at three pots, the uh, FY 2014 funds available to commit, the FY 2014 funds committed to activities, and finally manual payments and return funds in activity number two. And finally, number four, uh, we'll be dealing with developing a spending plan and committing and drawing the 2014 CDBG grant funds by the deadline. So who should be on this webinar? Uh, this webinar is intended for grantees that still have an undisbursed 2014 CDBG funds. And if you did not have these 2014 grant funds, this webinar will not apply to you, although there are certain skill sets that may actually be of assistance in future years. Why 2014 grant balances matter now. So 2014 grant buyer balances, or grants rather, expire this September 11th. And any 2014 funds remaining after that date will be lost to your program and your community. So it is important that all the draws be requested and approved by you to grantee by September 11th to avoid losing these funds. So a little bit of an overview here. Uh, since 20, since the program year, or federal year really, 2015, IDS has followed the grants-based accounting method. So that's where funds are both committed and drawn on a specific grant, specific, specific grant year. For instance, um, a grantee would commit funds from a specific grant year, and IDS would disperse funds from that same grant year, no matter when the draw was made. So soon these will be the only active grants. The 2014 grant is the last year that IDS will follow the first in, first out, or FIFO method. Under FIFO, IDS would automatically fund and draw from the oldest grant available. You also hear these grants referred to as pre-2015 grants. 
keeping this in mind uh, will be will really help clarify some of the things as we proceed through the webinar. So why do you still see 2014 grant funds when perhaps you had a long, long ago completed your 2014 action plan activities? There are several reasons. First, your community may have canceled an activity or completed an activity under budget, not that uncommon. The unused budget would then be released into the line of credit and perhaps they were just never, by, never reprogrammed by your community. Another big reason you may see 2014 grant funds remaining is that in the past, and this may even be a decade or two ago, uh, your jurisdiction had returned funds to HUD, which then entered the credit in IDS under activity number two. If no one ever applied that credit to the original activity for which the funds were returned, these funds may still be stuck in activity two. We'll cover that in, in some detail a little bit later. And to give some context on why you're hearing about this expiration of 2014 CDBG grant years this year, where you may not have really heard about it before, goes back to the FIFO method that we just mentioned in the previous slide. Your prior grants did expire at the end of the eighth federal fiscal year, but IDS automatically drew against those older funds before it went on to the newer grant years. Because 2014 is the last year of the FIFO method, um, draws made against 2015 and later activities never went back to draw 2014 grant funds. So everything is coming to a head this year and going forward, grants will continue to expire, but we do not anticipate nearly the scale or complexity that the end of this FIFO era has brought uh, this year. And of course, you'll be better prepared now, solutions are somewhat unique to each grantee, but we do hope that um, we'll be able to give you a little help to better have a better sense of a solution on your specific circumstances during this webinar. We've been receiving uh, many questions on the IDS Ask a Question over to HUD Exchange and um, we think you may have some of these types of questions. So a few examples for you. Um, why does my field office say I have $4,050 in 2014 funds to use? I don't have that as an available balance. Another question, my grants tab says I have 43,754 of 2014 CDBG committed to activities. How do I find it? Or I ran a PRO2 report and it says that I have money still in activity two. What do I need to do? So now we're going to delve a little deeper into the process for addressing your 2014 grant balances. This graphic illustrates the basics and we'll do, and we'll go through each step in detail. So, just real briefly um, on the left-hand side. So first step is, you know, we'll determine the 2014 CWG grant balance status. Um, once we do that, and that involves a little bit more than just what's my balance, uh, we'll look at how to find unexpended funds. We'll look at the three, three different pots, uh, what's available to fund, um, it's not currently committed, those funds that are committed to activities but not drawn, and some unresolved vouchers in activity two. Again, we're gonna delve into those and how to deal with those. After that, we'll look at how to commit funds, uh, including developing a spending plan, determining do you need an action plan amendment, and then just this process of committing funds to faster moving activities. And finally, we hope you'll be ready to complete the draws by September 11th, 2021. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Susan. Okay, thanks, John. So let's delve into this a little more now. And uh, so the first thing we wanna do is determine the 2014 
CDBG grant balance. And how do we do that? We're going to show you some steps on the next slide. So what you want to do is go to your grant tab in IDIS, and you're going to be searching for the grant. Um, on this screen, you can see that it has grant year 2014. Um, there's also reports you can run, like the PRO1 report, and we'll show you that a little bit later. Um, but when you go live in the system, you'll see exactly what's happening right now. You know, with uh, reports, they're always delayed by one day. So this is a nice way to look at it. So on the next slide, we're gonna see a little more detail. And here's where you wanna do your search. You want to select, select CDBG. Uh, you can select 2014 or you can leave it blank if you want to see all your grants, but the one that you wanna view is 2014. Um, you might think, well, do I have balances in other years? Maybe I have balances in 13, 12, 11 but you're not going to because of the FIFO method that John talked about earlier, where the system always drew the oldest money first. And so you wouldn't have any older money from 13 because it's all been drawn first. And also last year, the 13 money expired. And so even if you did have a balance last year, that would have been recaptured by the treasury. So let's look at the next slide. And now we'll see what you, see on the screen when you click the view on the grant tab. And this is the bottom of the screen. Uh, there's a lot more information further up the screen. Um, and this also is an example, you can see that there's no sub fund. And you know, many CDBG grantees, or I would say most CDBG grantees don't use the sub fund feature, which is the AD or SU, but some do. In this example, though, there's no sub funded amount. And so you can just simply look at the amount committed to activities, amount available to commit, and amount available to draw. The next slide will show some more information on this graphic. And if you look at these two circles, the left one is your entire grant. And of that entire grant, you have the amount that's been committed to activities, and then you have maybe a portion that's available to commit to activities. So that might be your situation. And then if you want to just look at the smaller circle on the right, this represents the amount that's committed to activities from the circle on the left. And of that amount that's committed to activities, you've drawn hopefully most of that money. And then you may have a small portion of that that's committed but not yet drawn. And so the things that we wanna focus on here is the amount available to commit in the left section, which is just money that has never been committed and the amount committed, but not drawn on the right-hand side. Now you can, as I mentioned earlier, you can run a PRO one report, which is, gives you information about your grant by year. And as you can see on this example, you have these different columns and you can see the amount committed to activities. You can see the amount available to commit to activities. And then you can also see the amount available to draw. Now, really there can be three scenarios. Uh, they're not all shown here, but I'll go through them. And the first scenario would be that your amount available to commit is equal to the amount available to draw. And if that's the situation, that means that all the money that's left in your grant has, is not committed to any activities, right? So you have a total available to commit and that same amount is available to draw. So it's all available for you to use in new activities or to add to activities. The second scenario is where you're available to commit is less than you're available to draw. And that means that some of your money is committed in activities, and then some of it is not committed and is, and is available for funding. And then the third scenario would be you're available to commit is zero, but you do have a balance that's available to draw. And that tells you that all the money is committed in activities. So now we'll switch it back over to John 
and he'll give you some more information about how to find those undrawn funds. Thank you, Susan. All right. So after you have an understanding of the balances remaining for your 2014 grant, you'll then want to determine exactly where those remaining 2014 funds are located. Some funds may be simply uncommitted and they will be available to fund any activity. Next, you'll want to find 2014 funds committed to specific activities, but not yet drawn. And as you replace the 2014 grant funds in slower moving activities, IDS will release those funds to the committed, to be committed elsewhere. So it kind of puts it back to that top pool where they're more available to commit to other activities. And then you can see if you have a balance in activity two, which may indicate collection payments, vouchers, or manual payments made for missed section 108 payments that were never revised. Again, we're gonna cover this later. Resolving these issues should release additional funds that can be committed to other activities. So that's kind of the, the process we're gonna go through. Now, the big question is, what are the open activities with undisbursed pre-2015 funds? This could normally require a fair amount of uh, time consuming detective work. But fortunately, HUD's Office of Block Grant Assistance has done a lot of the work for you. Uh, and they've developed a spreadsheet that they will period periodically update. Your HUD field office may have the spreadsheet easily accessible. And I know that we are able to provide that to you if you um, submit a question or request into the ask a question, uh, we can provide that same spreadsheet to you. Uh, we may be also able to post it. All right, open activity. So there's a the, the file, uh, the Excel file, the open activities with pre-2014 funding uh, shows the remaining balances of your pre-2015 grant by activity. And just remember the activity balances, <clears throat> excuse me, may include section 108 payment debits and unapplied repayment credits. The spreadsheet includes some simple instructions uh, and filters, so instructions are, you'll see them right into the, in the document, but essentially you can filter by the grantee name and filter for balances that are greater than zero. And then you should know exactly which activities have balances of your 2015 grant funds. You can see that activity two does behave a little differently. Uh, you can see the negative draws amounts in some instances, even in this example here. And so we're gonna go back to Susan, who will uh, explain some of the intricacies of activity two. Okay, thanks, John. So now let's get into a little more of the nitty gritty of activity two vouchers. And as John mentioned, it might contain debits if HUD withdrew funds for overdue section 108 payments. And this is important to take care of these vouchers and put them in the proper place because doing so gives you a clearer picture of the funds committed and available, available to commit. Because if you don't, then your available to commit funds can sometimes show more than what you really have as available. And then you also may have these repayment credits in activity two, and these could be from years ago and addressing these vouchers frees up the funds that are tied up in those credits. We'll look at a uh, little bit more detail now. What is activity two? A lot of people ask that question. And actually you can see on the screen here, we have an example of activities one, two, and three. There's actually two more. Uh, number four is for HAPWA and 
there's a special activity for the HTF funds. Um, it's historical data in there. For most grantees that have had grant funds for many, many years, you'll see um, that there's some historical draws that were done to bring IDIS into reconciliation with your LOCKS account when IDIS was first launched. And those usually show as converted. We're gonna look at that in a minute. Um, and then there may be these funds taken for overdue section 108 loan repayments, which are manual payments. And then it, it's also used for these return funds for the overdrawn or ineligible activities. And then sometimes there's even some special adjustments that are made in this activity. So this is an activity that uh, HUD uses for these special purposes, and you can't edit it as far as you can't change the name of it, you can't edit the funding, all you can do is make some revisions with the vouchers that are in there. So you're going to want to see if there's a balance in activity two, um, because that helps you see if you do have any of these uh, vouchers that you need to deal with. And so you're gonna look at the balance of activity two in the system. You can just go to your activity funding and pull up activity two. You're only gonna have a view option um, because you can't edit the activity funding. But the next slide is gonna show you what you see when you, when you look at this. And you can see that there's quite a lot funded, quite a lot drawn. And this again is because of those committed funds adjustment vouchers that were historical. Um, so don't be alarmed by the amount of money that's in there, but mostly what you wanna look at is the difference between the funded and the drawn. Because if there's more money funded than drawn, then that indicates that you have a credit that's available to you to use for return funds. Or if the amount that's drawn is more then the amount funded, that indicates that there may have been some manual payments taken from your line of credit. And again, this may not be all 2014 money. So um, that's why you wanna take a look at the actual vouchers that are in there. So this screen shows you, uh, we, we wanna take a look and see, well, what are the vouchers that we see in activity number two? Um, and there's some reports you can run, which we're going to show you in a minute. But also, like I said earlier, you can always just look right in the system and see live what's going on with everything. So you can go to your funding drawdown tab. And then on the left-hand side, you'll see the search voucher option under drawdown. And this brings you to a search voucher screen that you can use to search for any types of vouchers. And these search features are, uh, you can search by um, voucher number, line item status, grant number, and so forth. You're probably used to searching by voucher number, but in this case, we want to search by activity number. And so you'll enter a two for the activity ID. And one thing you want to do is take the date out of the earliest creation date. This is a default that you'll see when you get to that screen, it didn't used to be there. And it, a few releases ago, there, there's a default date in there now. And you do wanna take, erase that date out of there because you wanna be able to see all the vouchers, even those that are before that default date. You can also change the line item status to completed if you don't wanna see any revised vouchers. Revised vouchers are historical. Um, and so if you wanna see them, just leave that blank, the line item status, and then you'll see all the revised, but you don't have to be concerned about revised vouchers because those are just historical record of what happened with that voucher. So once you click search, you're gonna see a list. And this is kind of an example of what you might see on the screen. In this case, the results are page one of two. So there's actually two pages of results here. And so this gives you a little bit of a representation of what types of vouchers you may see. Um, so you see some that say converted AD, and those were some of those old uh, converted vouchers that were historical. You, you'll also see in this example, some revised payments. So these were manual payments that were put in to the system. They were originally completed and they've since been revised. So you don't have to be concerned with those. And so you're only gonna really wanna concentrate on the completed 
vouchers. And in this case, there's an example of one that's completed MP for manual payment, and that's a positive amount. And then you see some examples of completed CO, which represents collection, and those are a negative amount. And also in this example, you can see where the completed MP, manual payment for the positive, and then there's a completed CO very shortly after that. If you look at the dates, it's very close to that date. And that indicates that the grantee repaid the money that was taken from their line of credit for the late section 108 payment. So when those balance each other out, then you don't have to worry about making any revisions because they, the positive and the negative balance each other out. I'm gonna talk about each of these types of vouchers now in the next few slides. But first, um, this is an example of the PR07 report, which is a nice report to run. Uh, you can run that by date range if you'd like, or you can run it for all dates um, if you run the first version and then just filter out what you wanna see for activity two, or you can also run the PR05 report uh, for activity two if you'd like. Um, the PR05 report will only show the completed vouchers. The PR07 will show all the, all the vouchers. Um, and this will give you also everything on a neat report. But again, remember that the reports will always lag in IDIS by one day. So as I mentioned before, the converted vouchers are those ones that were made before IDIS was launched to get your LOX account in sync with everything. And so you don't have to do any revisions on those. You can't do any revisions on those and you can just ignore those. Next, we're gonna look at the manual payment vouchers. And again, I know we've said this quite a few times, but um, sometimes it's good to hear it more than once, um, but these were taken for overdue section 108 loan repayments. So if you had a section 108 loan and you were late at all in that making that payment, then HUD takes that from your line of credit and puts this as an positive voucher in activity two, which represents a debit from your account. It shows up as a completed MP, meaning completed manual payment. And then once it's revised is what will show as revised. And so um, you might say, well, okay, then what do I do with these payments? Well, the next slide, we're going to look at what you have to do when to take care of these. And the manual payment vouchers can't be revised by users. They have to be revised by the programmers. And so what we want you to do, once you've identified, if you've identified some that need to be revised, then you can submit and ask a question at the HUD exchange to request this. We will also look over the payments with you to make sure that the right ones will be revised. Because as I mentioned earlier, sometimes they will cancel each other out. So those don't have to be revised. Um, so if you have any questions, you don't necessarily have to know which ones have to be revised. But if you think you have some that have to be moved, then submit and ask a question. And what those, what those programmers will do then is move those vouchers or voucher to the Section 108 repayment activity. You should be having uh, a Section 108 repayment activity set up and you normally will set a new one up each year. Um, and maybe you might have to set one up for this because you might not have one already. Um, and that's what we'll ask you to do to get ready for this. And then we'll have the programmers um, take care of it. But this is very important to take care of these because if they aren't revised and moved, out of activity two, then it's going to possibly give you an inaccurate balance of available to commit. It can sometimes show more funds available to commit than what you really have. So next we'll look at the collection vouchers. And uh, these are the funds that were returned to your line of credit for either maybe you overdrew money, maybe you drew some money and you didn't mean to, or you drew more money than you should have, so you sent the excess money back. Or sometimes it was an ineligible cost or an ineligible activity that you uh, was determined maybe through a monitoring that you had to return the money 
to your line of credit. And these show as a negative amount, meaning it's a credit. And they will show as completed CO, meaning collection. These vouchers you can revise yourself. And these you'll, you will be revising to the activity for which you return the funds. Um, before we get into those details though, um, the vouchers, you don't see this on this screen, but the vouchers will show with a, with a grant number next to them. And that tells you the year of the money. And that's important to know when you do the revision. So the next slide will go through the process of revising these collection vouchers. And again, you have to identify what was the activity for which this money was returned. Now, it, it could be one activity or it could be more than one activity, um, but the vouchers show with a year next to them and there may be more than one of these collection vouchers because if you returned money for more than one year, you would have had to send in wires separately so that there was a collection voucher maybe for your 2005 money and then a separate collection voucher maybe for your 2006 money. That's important because the funds that were originally expended from the activity for which you return this money has to match the voucher that's in this collection, that has to match the year in the collection voucher. And if it doesn't, then it can still be revised, but we'll have to get the programmers to help you. But what happens when you do this is revising that negative voucher or that credit, as we said, reduces the drawn amount from the original activity and puts it back into the funded amount, which then can be used somewhere else before the deadline to spend these funds. So how do you know what activities to revise these to? We'll look at the next slide and see some ways that you can help figure this out. Because in some cases, these collection vouchers are very old and maybe there isn't anyone there that knows the history of why these, this money was sent back. So we suggest that you look at some monitoring reports that perhaps were done around the time that these vouchers were returned. You can see in the system, when you look at the vouchers, there'll be a date and that's approximately the date you sent back the money. It takes a couple weeks. So chances are you would have sent that money back about one to two weeks before the date of the voucher. So you can look at monitoring reports, you can look at audit reports, uh, maybe you have, it was something from your single audit. You can look at your HUD correspondence, you can check with your HUD field office, and you can also run reports like the PR07 report to see what draws you made during, from that same grant year. You wanna look at the grant year of the money you can even search in IDIS when we were looking at that search voucher screen earlier, you notice that we, you can also search by grant number. So you could even paste the grant number next to that collection voucher. You could paste that same grant number in your search voucher screen and search for those vouchers to see what pops up and what maybe to try to find why this money was returned if it matches something. But we have been told that if you've done your due diligence, you've looked for all your records, and maybe you still can't figure out why these funds were returned, then we've been told that you can use, that you can apply this back to the admin activity that originally drew those funds. So for example, if it was 2005 money, then you would have to search for the admin activity that drew from 2005 money. That might not be, that probably wasn't your 2005 activity, but maybe it was your 2007 activity because maybe in 2007, you were drawing 2005 funds because of first in, first out. But anyway, you can search that again by the PRO7 report, or you can just search by the grant number, and then you can apply it to that activity. So the next slide, um, when you do that, and one thing, to note is that the activity has to be open in order to revise the collection voucher to it. And especially with these older 
vouchers, chances are the activities will be completed. So before you revise that collection voucher, you will have to reopen the activity. If there's still gonna be money left in it, you wanna make sure you make a note of that completion, original completion date before you click the reopen button, just so you have that handy. And you'll just click, you'll just click view. Um, after you search for the activity, you'll, you'll see a view option, you'll click view, and then you'll see the reopen activity option at the top of the screen. And then after you revise those vouchers, then the funds will no longer show as drawn in that activity. It will now show as funded, but not drawn. And you will want to make sure you release those excess funds by reducing the activity funding or completing the activity, which will release those funds. And then those funds will now become available to commit. And you can now use them for other activities that are going to have draws before the September 11th deadline. And there's a, a memo called the Methods for Returning Community Development Block Grant Funds that gives you step-by-step -step directions on how to do these voucher revisions, but we also can give you the instructions and other information in the Ask a Question. So if you have any follow-up questions about how to do these revisions, um, or which vouchers to revise or anything like that, we're happy to give you some additional instructions on the Ask a Question um, by submitting that to the uh, HUD exchange. So now next we'll go to John and he's gonna go over some final information about how to use this final balance of funds. All right, great, thanks, Susan. At this point, we're talking about what to do when you have found where your 2014 funds and tucked away to res resolved any of the outstanding activity to vouchers as, as Susan just walked you through. So now it's time to make sure your 2014 grant balance is committed to activities that can be expended or, or really dispersed by September 11th. Let's talk briefly about developing a spending plan to make the deadline. And we'll also want to talk a little bit about uh, a few things to consider, such as determining if an action plan amendment is needed. So at this point, your undisbursed 2014 grant funds are hopefully either in two spots. Either they're not committed to an activity including funds released from activity two and therefore available for funding to other activities, or they're committed to activities that you have previously identified using the Excel file or other means, uh, such as the activity two uh, instructions uh, Susan just shared. And so these activities may include 2014 funds that are just where they need to be, uh, and you're confident that if you leave them in those activities, you'll expend them by September 11th. Or it's also possible these activities are such that the 2014 funds won't be fully expended by September 11th, and they will need to be reallocated. A quick reminder to the few CDBG grantees that may be listening uh, that actually do use subfunds for CBG, not home, but CDBG subfunds. Uh, in this case, 2014 funds may also be stuck in these subfunds, and there are a few extra steps. We won't cover that today, but if you do have questions, feel free to contact us uh, through this. IDS ask a question, uh, and we can help you uh, identify ways to free up those funds as well. Now let's talk about a few options to consider in your spending plan. Uh, you really kind of need, some of you may have an easier time, but some of you really need to be a little bit strategic. First, uh, let, we'll look at existing activities that can disperse funds by deadline. So this is identify and commit 2014 funds to activities that can draw down against by 2011, September 11th, 2012, or rather 2021. This may include the activity in which the 2014 grant funds are currently committed, or you may need to identify other activities that are ready to draw down 
those funds uh, by the deadline. In this case, you'll want to reduce funding from the later grant years. In many cases, you may determine to, you know, you may be determined that you just simply swap 2014 grants funds with the new funds. Alternatively, you may need to reprogram these funds elsewhere if they are not needed. Just remember, CDBG admin is an option. Um, they, you know, typically have steady draws that are needed. Um, and there's a couple things about program income that we'll want to uh, talk to you about as well. Um, and, and by really using these older funds in your admin activity for later years, you also might help yourself by making it easier to pass this newer second admin cap test. So in any case, for many grantees on the phone who don't have that many, that much funds to be expended, this may be really all you need to do. Now, grantees with outstanding Section 108 balances, you know, Section 108 loan guarantee balances may be able to pay down some of their 2014 funds by using their 2014 grant. Uh, if you, again, have outstanding uh, Section 108 balances, you may want to consult with your field office and explore the possibility of using your 2014 entitlement grant to pay down these balances. Uh, and then in some cases, you, you really may need to be more proactive. Uh, so you may be familiar with this kind of exercise. Um, perhaps you do it as you uh, approach your CDBG timeliness test, you know, 60 days before the next program year, typically. Um, and you got to just make sure you find the way to expend these funds and you may need to reallocate, et cetera. But in this case, it's just this added twist where you're going to focus on how to use your 2014 grant funds. <clears throat> Uh, you may need to look at other activities. So you can review your activities and reach out to your partner agencies, your subrecipients or local governments if you're a state um, to see if there are needs that can be addressed during the summer. Uh, some states we've heard about have even revised their method of distribution, you know, broaden the criteria to make more, more uh, projects eligible. Obviously, um, there's a timeline on that. You may be able to accelerate some work and payment schedules for infrastructure or other projects. So if you're in the middle of some large infrastructure projects, um, you may find opportunities to say, okay, rather than receive the invoice when everything is done, there might be some interim uh, payments you're able to make as long as the work is completed. And then, Time is short, but there may be some new activities that are ready to go this summer. Um, and just obviously you wanna make sure that your environmental review requirements are met and um, the work is completed before any payment is made. A few other considerations that we wanna look at. Uh, one is the impact of program income receded. So as you know, uh, the requirement that you must expend program income that you, that you receive and report prior to drawing down regular entitlement funds. So just keep that in mind as you're looking at your spending plan and, and you know, don't make sure you're accounting for that before assuming that you're gonna be able to spend your 2014 grant funds. Uh, do think a little bit about the impact on future grant deadlines. So if you are swapping money, for example, uh, 2014 versus 2015, you're gonna have uh, the 2015 grant deadline coming up next year. So just remember swapping for different years of funds uh, may impact future deadlines. Uh, communication is very important. Um, you want to do that immediately to work with your, your financing accounting staff to make sure 
they're on board and you know, you've got a program to make sure you're using the 2014 funds first and that you've got a plan. Um, you may wanna reach out to your subrecipients or units of local governments if you're state to identify, to, to ensure that you're gonna get their pay, their invoices uh, soon, you know, giving you sufficient time to review and, and disperse the funds before the deadline. You will wanna look at your citizen participation plan to see whether you've triggered any of these changes will trigger a substantial amendment to your action plan so you could build that into your timeline. And you know, certainly always reach out to your CPD uh, HUD representative for any guidance on that and for additional questions. And Finally, um, hopefully if you've done all that work, you are ready to go and complete the draws. So just keep in mind that means that you must have somebody in your office first create the draw and then somebody else will need to approve the draw. So just make sure that's set. Uh, do make sure everybody has their active IDS IDs uh, that you're going online <laughs> beforehand to make sure that they don't expire. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Rob. Hey, thank you, John and Susan for that. Um, we're gonna go into, uh, this is not the live, but we do have some questions um, that we're gonna read off and uh, have answered um, here on the recording, uh, questions that were submitted. Uh, during the live webinar. And I'll go over to those now. Let's see, um, let's start off with uh, Susan, give you a rest there, John. Um, so uh, the question is, if you have an amount available to commit, uh, but no amount to draw, do you need to be concerned? Well, that can happen. And um, if you don't have anything to draw, then that means your grant is zero and you don't have a balance. Uh, sometimes we do see this happen where it's showing an amount available to commit, but nothing available to draw. And that's a little bit of a issue in the system that can happen. And this is usually due to those section 108 manual payments. Um, so your, your balance in your grant, which is the balance to draw, is your true indicator of what you have left. And if that's zero, then you really don't have any 2014 funds left, um, but you'll still need to take care of those manual payments by submitting a question so we can have the programmers move it to the correct um, activity and get that cleaned up. Great, thanks, Susan. Um, let's skip over to John. Um, is the September 11th the deadline to create the voucher? or to approve the voucher? Uh, the deadline is to approve the, the, the voucher. So the, um, the draw really needs to be complete. And that means it both needs to be created and approved by the grantee. And then it should go over to, uh, to locks and, and send the money. I mean, I would really try to make sure everything's done a few days prior to that. Just, uh, you don't wanna be at that last deadline and, and finding you neg neglected a step. So I would uh, urge folks to try to get a little bit ahead of this and to make sure you're checking in the system the day before to make sure there's no open draws just sitting there, open vouchers that you thought you had, you had approved and were ready to go, but they are not. And you know, John, this would be a good time, I think, to remind folks that um, you also, you, you mentioned earlier to make sure you're active in IDIS um, because users that don't log in in 90 days will have their IDs deleted from the system. And we get questions all the time for people that are trying to log in and they can't get in. And it turns out that their ID was deleted because they didn't use the system for at least 90 days. So we really recommend that even if you're not a regular user, that you go in at least once a month just to keep your ID active 
just log into the system. You don't have to actually do anything like change anything or edit, but you have to at least log in and, and just look at some screens if nothing else. And that way you'll be sure that you'll have active users because you know there has to be a separate user that creates a voucher and approves a voucher. Right, and here's, here's one uh, for you, Susan. Uh, the question is, if we cannot release or reallocate Activity 2 funds, what's the worst case scenario? Well, uh, what can happen, I guess, is that um, you won't be able to draw those, those funds by the deadline and they'll be recaptured by the treasury. That means that the money doesn't even go back to HUD, it actually goes back to the general treasury and uh, which will be a shame because it's money that could be spent on eligible activities. So that's kind of the worst case scenario. We hope that doesn't happen. Indeed. Um, John, here's a reporting question. So uh, this grantee ran a PRO3 report and activity number two, uh, the grantee can clearly see a credit balance. However, they don't see that amount under activity two when they search vouchers. What's going on there? Well, it, it's a good question. In fact, it kind of comes into using a, some different IDIS reports as you're trying to investigate. Um, one of the challenges we see, and we really did look at many of the reports to say, okay, how do you sort of deal with some of these issues that are 2014, um, you know, dealing with the older, FIFO grants and some of the reports really are better suited to dealing with grant specific issues once 2015 grant year rolls around. So the PRO3 report, um, you know, and the BOSMAC report is some a report that I love <laughs> for, for really looking at data, but I think I would use it less to sort of help necessarily investigate where where the status of a particular grant year is. It really wasn't designed for that. Um, similarly, you know, there's, we, we, grantees can use the, one of the PR26 reports or even the PR70 report to start to investigate some of these issues. But I would really recommend that for these pre-2015 activities that you use the spreadsheet that uh, the Office of Block Grant Assistance has made available um, to grantees, and that will help identify where things are, uh, where, where your committed funds are locked up immediately, and then turning over to, particularly if you have activity number two issues, looking at the PR7 report, or searching directly in IDAS to get some of the details. Uh, and there is sometimes where there is still a mystery. You can do all those things and there's a mystery. Um, every once in a while, we have to dig deeper or even get the ideas programmers involved. And you know, if you get into that situation, do submit a question to the IDS Ask a Question pool. Um, we can both give you the report. Again, if you re need this report, uh, if you can't get it from your field office, we're happy to send it your way or, uh, try to walk you through any additional investigation. Great, thank you. And speaking of reports, that was a question for Susan. Um, does the PR26 report show the 2014 funds? Oh yeah, there's a there's this newer PR26 activity summary by selected grant year report. Uh, it's, you, you select it when you go to reports, you go to the PR26 suite of reports, and you'll see the original financial summary, but you'll also see this newer one called the activity summary by selected grant year. And this report is great for seeing activities that are funded from the specific year that you're running the report for. You can run the report for more than one year. It will show you then separate sections for each year. And it just simply gives you a picture of what activities are funded from that particular grant year. And it's a great report, except that it doesn't really work properly for 14 and earlier money. Um, sometimes it will show an activity is open, but not with any balance, even though it does have a balance of 14 money. It just wasn't designed 
to work with the FIFO money. And so um, it's not really reliable for finding activities that have unspent 14 money. That's why HUD made this Excel spreadsheet available for everyone. Um, but it is a great resource for 15 and later funds. And so we do highly recommend using that if you're trying to find where other years money, uh, 15 and later is located. And uh, Rob, do you have any other questions? Rob? I think he might have, maybe we lost his audio. Um, so uh, let's see, um, I know that um, one, another question that was asked was how do they get this Excel spreadsheet? And I think we mentioned it earlier, but your field office probably will have it and they can give it to you. Um, if you can't get it that way, we can provide that information to you through the HUD Ask a Question um, on the HUD Exchange, uh, the IDIS Ask a Question. So we'd be happy to give you that information if you need that as well. And again, this Excel spreadsheet is shows what activities you currently have 2014 money in um, so that you can use it or release it from those activities. Thank um, you, Susan. Anything else from your point? We... No, I think that's it for me. All right. It looks like Rob did get dropped off. <laughs> um, so good timing. We're actually just wrapping up here. Um, so just want to draw your attention uh, some methods some of the resources um you know there are the uh, the methods for returning community development block grant funds memo um you'll be able to link to it directly when you, we post the materials or or search in the hud exchange we'll be able to turn that up pretty quickly um there's um various reporting requirements there's a, another document uh reporting requirements in IDS for Section 108 loan guarantee recipients. Um, that may be a useful guide. And then, of course, the IDS user manuals, both for entitlements and states, and the online reports user guide. So that um, is really just a few of the resources. We also, of course, invite you to um, ask any follow-up questions through the HUD exchange. IDIS ask a question pool uh, will be ready to try to deal with any individual questions there. And right, thank you, with Tony. that, uh, oh, are we back, Rob? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and um, um, I just, well, Rob wanted to just, finish up with something that um, Kupeng had wanted to mention uh, to everyone that um, this is now going to happen every year where funds are going to expire. They have been happening, but it wasn't such an issue before with the FIFO reporting. But now with grant-based accounting next year in September, the 2015 funds will expire. And so um, the skills that you learn from this webinar will also help you identify and plan for those expiring funds when the time comes. Um, and also activity two, as I mentioned earlier, has voucher, it may have vouchers from return funds from 15 and later years. And if that's the case, you do need to take care of those. It's really best to take care of them as right after you return the funds or if there's a manual payment uh, sooner rather than later so that everything can be in balance and you can see the correct information in IDIS. So I just wanted to um, wrap up with that as well. Great, thank you, Susan. And uh, thank you everyone um, for joining us today. It's all the time that we have. Um, again, as John was mentioning, please take advantage of the resources on HUD Exchange. Um, please submit any questions uh, that you have after listening to this to IDIS Ask a Question. Um, and uh, thanks again to uh, yeah, John and Susan, uh, to 
Fu Ping uh, Wang and uh, Aaron Martin for their contributions, um, to Laura Dieter for the slides and Joel Warren for managing the question and Nikki Deininger, our register for and host. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, keep up the work and be well. Thank you.